Um, so it, it is Thanksgiving Sunday today, and Dr. Jowers is away at a conference. But you know my memory, it's a little fuzzy, so all you got is me today. And after, just a quick announcement, um, after, the, after lunch, you, will, you don't have, no, I'm sorry, but after snack, we don't have Bible study, but you're going to join your parents for another, another service, yay, at 11.30. So we'll have a joint service as a family together. Um, so you, so um, we get to have two services today. Everyone go, yay! Okay, you guys are like, oh, no, not really. But um, you know, it's it's a meaningful day to you know spend some time with your family. Um, so let's try to be a little bit more joyous about it. Okay, so let's get our Bibles out, everybody. It, okay, sorry. Can I have you guys shift a little this way? <laughs> Sorry, I know I, I hate to uproot you, but I'm like over here and you guys are like way over there. Can I have everyone kind of shift in these two rows? Is that okay? Sorry. Sorry. But I feel like my neck's going to have a big pain from just stay, looking at it this way. So thank you, Michelle. You go, girl. Thanks. Now it's somewhat a little bit more balanced. Okay. Kevin, you, you move her this way too. 형들이랑 같이 앉아. 누나랑 같이 앉아도 되고. Okay. 거기가 제일 안 보여. 차라리 여기 앉아, 여기. 거기가 제일 안 보여, 진짜. So, okay, let's get our Bibles out. And it's going to be on the same passage as last week. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Am I missing DJ? She's in the bathroom. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah. It's nice to have this in, sort of an intimate surrounding, isn't it? Instead of a formal service. Just sort of change in the pace here. Um, inher- so today's message is titled Inheritance, and it's related to the, uh, the message from last week. Um, so last Sunday we learned that we are indeed adopted children of God. We learned about our adoption and the joy of do- adoption. In fact, and you guys remember Tanner Butterfly, her name's kind of hard to forget. Um, and she was so joyous though, and she found out that she was being adopted in her school office. She jumped up into the arms of an office manager lady that was there, and, and she held on to her for a good two minutes. And she would not let go because she was so joyous, she was so happy, she was so thrilled that she was being adopted. Uh, I told you the alarming rates of foster children in the state, in in, in the United States. Um, there are about 247,000 children that are in foster care. Only 13 to 14 percent of them get adopted into permanent families. So the rest of them are fatherless, motherless and just families, they didn't have a permanent home. But it is not like that with us, for we are adopted sons and daughters of God. And we also found out that as, as children of God, God, not only God, does God lavish us with eternal life and salvation. I mean, salvation is eternal life, but God also lavishes us to be Heirs of Christ, co-heirs of Christ, and that's that's, that's significant. Okay, um, it means we are equal sons to God as Jesus Christ. How can that be? Um, but God considers us so dear that He promises us certain certain things in His as inheritance to us, and that's what we're going to find out. Um, you know, inheritance, determined inheritance, may, might, it might be a little strange for you guys. I mean, after all, your parents are still young, you're still young, and you, know, you don't think about stuff like that. And it wasn't until recently that I started thinking about, hey, my mom could actually be gone <coughs> any day now. Um, she's at that age where she's, she's aging, and... Um, and then she's getting older, and she's, you know, and she's faced, she's, she's, she's uh, one step closer to death, and that's the reality of it, and there's no way to avoid it. And that's everyone needs 
um, everyone gets to say goodbye to their life uh, and their timeline, and, and it's, every, it's becoming a real reality for us. Um, so, you know, we would sit down and talk about, hey, what should we do about this? You know, we kind of joke about it, but it's a reality for me. So, talking about inheritance is, is, is a reality for us. Um, and it, it may be a re and it's a reality for you as well. Um, it's the parents' biggest wish to leave their children a great inheritance. Um, I mean, it could be in form of wealth, it could be in form of a legacy, um, but you know, it's it's a parent's wish to you know, as they depart from this world, to leave the children with something that they can live on. Um, and God's covenant. <coughs> names us. What is a covenant? It's a contract. But also the theme, um, the term um, diatheke also indicates that it's also a will. When Jesus died, God named us as the heirs of God's inheritance. And that's what it gives, that should give us a different perspective on how we should live in this world. It strengthens us through present and future suffering. And it enlightens our minds to escape from temptations of this world. Okay, and how does it do that? And and and, and here's the thing. So um, if you if you're unfamiliar with how a will works, it's there's a process involved. Uh, there needs to be a you know an executor, a mediator that executes the will. But you know those are all technicalities. But what you should really know is that um, this is really depressing, I you know. But when you let's talk about in terms of uh, earthly will. And when your parents die, there's an executor that executes your will. Your parents leave a piece of paper that says, okay, if you have siblings, she's going to have this, he's going to have that, and. Um, there's an executor that makes sure that you guys get that. You don't even have a choice, and you know. But but there's also a process that is not involved. And it's, it's the same thing with God's will, God's covenant. There's a process involved, and, um, and it's mentioned in Romans eight seventeen. Let's go to verse seventeen. Verse seventeen, and it says, "Can we all read it together, please, in one voice?" If you guys haven't. Find the passage. It's not going to be up there. <laughs> okay, open your Bible to Book of Romans, chapter eight, verses fourteen to seventeen. Open it up now. Okay, if you're there, let's read it on one voice. Get it all there. Okay, let's read it in one voice. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may also be glorified with Him. So here's the thing: it says, "If children, then heirs; heirs of God and fellow fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him, in order that we may also be glorified with Him." And 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 the Bible, the Bible says, "If children." Now, there is no doubt that we are the children of God. Okay, Our sonship is guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. It's not guaranteed by none other than God himself, Spirit of God himself. Verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. But he writes immediately after, If children. Okay, So Paul is saying, Okay, so you are children of God. That's guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. If children, okay, and he's making sure that you understand that is your new identity. You are a child of God. And he's reminding us of our inheritance. If we are surely God's children, then we're surely fellow heirs with Christ. However, Paul also reminds us that if we're surely his children heirs, here's the part that's scary. There's a condition that precedes our inheriting God's riches, and that is to suffer with Christ. So suffering is a must if you want to receive an inheritance. And some of you might ask, then why do we have to suffer? I mean, right? 
I mean, why can't we just receive our inheritance? Why do we do we have to suffer? Well, no one, nobody likes to be in pain. Nobody likes to suffer, right? It would be a little weird if you like that kind of pain. If you like, but no one likes to grin and bear pain in life. In fact, we fo tend to focus on our, our, our life on uh, you know, so we sort of make it a point in our life not to be in any kind of pain, right? Um, so this is what we do. Our attitude in life tends to shift in a way that we may not be hurt in a way. And this is what you guys do. Is we build up a de defense mechanism. This is one thing we do. We detach ourselves emotionally. Ignorance. We so sometimes ignore just what's going on in the outside world. We don't want to have to share any kind of pain that's going on. That's our defense mechanism. And it's called apathy. Um, and if we are satisfied, if we meet our basic needs and wants, we're fed well, you know, we have some of the things that we want, and you, you, and you don't want to go any further than that little bubble of contentment. You don't, have, you don't want to be involved with anything outside your little contentment, and it becomes apathy. And, and you're satisfied. Then you don't have to suffer, you don't have to share pain with anybody. Right? But Jesus hates that. That's what's called complacency. You guys have learned about it. Like, he's like, yeah, I know that word. That's what complacency is. It's being content in your little bubble and saying, I don't need any more. I'm just fine where I am. But Jesus hates it. I'll tell you why. Revelation 3.16 So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will speak, spit you out of my mouth. So this is Jesus saying, okay, so you're either for me or against me. Don't be somewhere in the middle and saying, okay, you know, I'm fine where I am. I have my daily life. I have my basic needs and wants. I go to church on Sundays and I'm good. And Jesus hates that. He wants you, he wants you to be either entirely for him or against him. And he says, eventually I will speak out of my mouth. And I'm going to you know, preach on that on another, another day. But this is Jesus' warning against that defense mechanism not to be hurt. So don't be afraid of suffering. It's actually a blessing that because you know you're going to be glorified in Jesus. And that's what's promised in 17. If you suffer, then you're going to be glorified with Christ. But you must suffer. Luke 9.23, and he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Okay. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When we live our lives as children of God, we put to death our old selves and when we were in sin and live a new life in Christ every day. That's what when Jesus says, pick up your cross and deny yourself. Okay. And as we walk this path, the world doesn't understand this because it's an upside down, inside out reality. It's a backwards reality for the world. We were watching a movie on Friday, and the last line um, it was it was about owls. <laughs> but anyways, the, the last line of the movie was something like this: "It's to make the weak strong, the strong, and make strong the weak." That doesn't make sense to the world. In this world, the strong prevails and the strong is successful. But Jesus says, no. In my kingdom, the strong will be humbled. The weak will be lifted. The world doesn't understand it because the world says, is it out to teach you to disobey and destroy the way of truth, the way of life. So you will be persecuted. When you say Jesus is the only way, people will say, why does Jesus have why does Jesus have to be the only way? Why does he need to be in the control of your life, my life? When you will be persecuted when you speak the truth. 
You will be persecuted in various forms. You will be ignored, ashamed, and sometimes abandoned for your faith. Okay? Whatever we may experience in our life, though, God encourages us by reminding us of his love for us. Hebrews 12, 16. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves. And chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? Guys, it's the same thing with your parents. Do you ever did you ever doubt that your parents love you? <laughs> okay, do you just like no? Um, well, you know we think. You know the biggest moment that when we pick doubt our parents. You know, I'm like, does my mom really love me? Like that moment comes when you're like in trouble with your mom or your dad, right? When they yell at you for doing something wrong, you're like, do you really love me, mom or dad? But that's the moment they love you the most. You know, I, I, I talk about Aaron a lot because I learned a lot from my relationship with him. I can see what God is doing with me. So I see little Aaron, and he has no idea what danger is. And Joanna and John, and you guys help me watch him a lot. And you know the little baby. He goes everywhere, touches everything. He likes to, this is true, he likes to stick his finger in an outlet. He doesn't care. He doesn't know that there's, there's danger involved in that. He just kind of, you know, he, and he, like he's, he likes to stick his wet fingers in an outlet, an electrical outlet. And unless I tell him, no, Eden. What do you think you're doing? You're gonna die if you do this. He's gonna keep doing that, and he likes to climb up to things and then jump off or fall because he doesn't know how to climb down. And you know, <laughs> this one time, he <laughs> he's going down the stairs. He doesn't know how to step down yet, so he's climbing down the stairs with the butt, and he makes a he makes a misstep, and he sort of rolls down the stairs like this. And he's like, what the heck? Like, you, you can see that on his face. And he's like, what the heck? Why did my mom let me do this? <laughs> and, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't great at all. It's where, where we have carpeted stairs. But, you know, it's, it's kind of like that. If I don't tell him, if, no, and I don't, if I don't yell at him, he'll still continue to, he'll continue to reach out to that danger and, and live a way of destruction, even the way of destruction. And that's the same thing with us. We think we know everything. You, we don't. We, we still learn something new every day. Okay, and God, so God, the Bible says he hedges us in. So like a good shepherd, he hedges us in through suffering. There are some things you will never learn unless you're hurt. Okay, so one of the weaknesses that I had was I like guys. I'll be honest. <laughs> so I like guys, and, and I didn't know, and I, I had this fantasy where, hey, I can't date a non-Christian guy and make him a Christian. I dated a Buddhist guy once, so he took me to his Buddhist temple, and, uh, and I realized how wrong my notion was. There was no way we could have been compatible, okay? Um, and, you know, and it hurt in the way of learning that lesson. You know, that's, and, it, uh, and that's sort of the lighter side of it. The tougher side for me was to know that my, my earthly father could actually abandon me. Um, and, and, but in the end, in the end, I told you guys, I gained an intimacy with my heavenly father that I, and, and I, no one can take that away from me. So I gained more than I lost. I spoke to you guys about that. So God says, I love you, so I am going to put you through that suffering because that maybe that's the only way you'll learn. That's how the Israelites learned in the Old Testament, if you remember. That was the only way that they could learn. Our father is not an irresponsible father who spoils by us by saying they were saying no. If your parents kept giving you candy, but you shouldn't have, then you would have rotten teeth and rotten mouth, then you'd be suffering. Are they responsible parents? No. 
They're irresponsible parents. They're, in fact, they're categorized as bad parents. So he helps us to mature. He helps us to grow in endurance, patience, and learn to fight for what's right. And forgive where forgiveness is needed. That's why suffering is there. Now, our inheritance, God, is not composed of things that are temporary. All things in the world are temporary, right, guys? I mean, your watch eventually stops working, your shoes wear out, your clothes tear off and wear out, right? Um, and even fame, wealth or, wealth, or even good deeds, they fade away over time. Do you think that somebody, that, you know, and some, some things, do get remembered, but over time, it fades away. Only things unseen remain eternal. And God promises us eternal inheritance that will never go away. Okay, so what, then what is our inheritance in God? Right, what does, get, what does, what does God promise to give us? Well, first of all, first of all, God promises us to give the world. You guys, <laughs> God promises us to give the world. First Corinthians 3, 20 to 23. So let no one boast in men, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world or life or death, the present or the future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God's. So what is this saying? I know it's confusing, it's like a riddle. But basically it says the world belongs to God, right? God is who God it governs the entire world. And because we are gods, we get to share. We have a share in that in, in this world. Now practically, what does this mean? Now it doesn't mean that you get to strut around the world and say, hey, I'm the king of this world. Okay, it doesn't work that way, but rather, this is what it means. So, first we must understand that our spiritual confirmation, uh, not, not confirmation, con conform, conformity, conform, conformation that occurs as we live as children of God. Romans 8, 29, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. So what that means is God shapes you, he changes you in a way that you become more like Jesus. And that begins with your spiritual side of things. Your spirit begins to change. Okay? That's what sanctification is. How many of you heard of the term sanctification? Yes? No? Not really, okay. It basically means you're being sanctified, you're becoming more holy, and in, in other words, you're just becoming more like Jesus every day. Okay. When this happens, this world, whatever, whatever happens to you, it can never fit, you can never succeed to take this joy from you. Whatever happens. We see Paul and Silas singing in jail, despite having been beaten unjustly. Apostle Paul and Silas were preaching the good news and and people and the other leaders were jealous so they had they had him arrested and beaten and they were put in the jail but in the in the night as they were in their cuffs they were singing hymns they sang praise in a circumstance where they would have been rightly angry or sad they were joyous Because they knew that this is one of my favorite verses, Romans 8, 35, 36, and 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you guys get that? Whether it be famine, distress, tribulation, persecution, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. 
We are more than conquerors of these things in Christ who loves us. Christ is the one that's going to be lifted up and this is a testimony of someone. Christ is the one that's going to be lifted up. You lean into what you don't understand. You lean into the Lord. I will submit this to everyone. Whatever life brings to you, lean on the Lord in your own understanding. I don't understand, but I know my God does. Guess who said it? Guess who said this? Frank Pomeroy, who's the father, who's the pastor of the church, where 26 people were killed, 20 were injured at the tax Texas mass shooting. She, he lost his 14-year-old daughter, and he lost his entire church. And he said, Christ the one, Christ is the one. That's going to be lifted up. I don't understand it, but I'm going to lean and understand. I'm going to lean on to somebody who does, and that's our God. And Christ is the one that's going to be lifted up. And this is the living day example of Romans 8, 34 to 37. Guys, no one can take away the joy that's in his heart, even this tragedy. And that's what the having the world as our inheritance means. We live in a fallen world. Any tragedy can strike us every day. Hurricanes come, earthquakes come. I mean, that's our reality, but no one can take away the joy that's in our heart. Because God is in God. We are loved by God. In the world, in Matthew 13, 43, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is God's kingdom. And in his kingdom, we shine no matter what. Because we're children of God. Number two, what does God give us out of the world? Our bodily change. And we're no, it doesn't mean you're going to lose weight and we're all going to pretty all of a sudden for, for you girls. No, our bodily change means it's all it's about actions. We're not only being conformed spiritually, but we're also being conformed in our bodies. What does that mean? Okay, Jesus was a complete human. There's no doubt about that, right? I mean, he was tired, he was hungry, he cried, he, he got angry, you know, he was hurt. I mean, Jesus was, you know, when Jesus was some superhuman, when you, if you poke him, he would bleed. No, he bled. He was cut. He was, he was hurt all the time. He was so tired. He couldn't, you know, think about it. People were following him everywhere he went. He didn't get much sleep. He didn't get much rest. But it says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was complete human, just like us. You know, waking up on Sunday morning is early is hard. I'll admit it. I always struggle too. When the alarm goes off at 7.30, I'm like, Lord, I'm going to sleep for five more minutes. You be with me. I wake up half an hour later, and I'm going, oh man, I did that again. Okay? I don't wake up in the morning. Just because I'm a pastor doesn't mean I get up Sunday morning all joyous. Ah! I'm gonna go worship God. No, I struggle too. And, I'm, and I feel like Jesus probably did as well. He was tired. I mean, seriously, like 12 disciples were right there everywhere he went. But, and you know, they were always bothering him. God, who's better, my brother or I? Jesus, tell me about this. Jeez, these were grown men that was accompanying Jesus as leaders of this world. But Jesus, nevertheless, Nevertheless, it says he was perfect and without sin. So he set a great example for us to follow it. It's not impossible for it to live like Jesus. Okay? That's our bodily change. Apostle Paul says, For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. You know, something tedious as eating or drinking, he says, do it for the glory of God. What does that mean? I imagine it for me that we should 
that I could be eating hamburger every day that would drive my cholesterol up through the roof, but I don't. I sometimes give in, but I try to eat healthier because this is the temple of God. God dwells in this. Okay? I mean, I am 